بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. The people of Prophet Lut عليه السلام when he said to them what he said they responded back with we have no need for your daughters but you know what we desire you know very well what we want why am i starting with this their worldview the way they see the world in terms of what they should pursue was about desires it was not about the truth I don't need, in other words, they are saying, we don't need an evidence that you are a prophet or that we should worship Allah or change our lives or change our habits because we know what we desire. We don't want what you're offering. And of course, when we talk about the truth and we talk about desires, I think we can all agree the truth is more important than our desires. Do you agree with this statement, yes or no? Yes, we agree with this statement. Why? Desires, we all know, we have many different types of desires. Some desires may be beneficial. There's something good. They may also be extremely harmful. Is this possible that your desires may lead you to something harmful, yes or no? Absolutely, we all know this. It could be a minor example like your desire for some junk food, as an example. This is one example. Your desire for Apple over Android. La ilaha illallah, may Allah guide you all. I'm just kidding, of course. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Pay attention. The truth over our desires. We know this. We say this. And yet, the reality is, their worldview, what they decided was more important, were their desires. And that is not unique to the people of Prophet Lut alayhi salam. That is in fact how many human beings are living in America and around the world today. And while we may be stating that as though we are talking only about non-Muslims, this may affect us as Muslims too. How often do we desire something that we know is haram? We know what the truth is. And then we choose that desire over the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us. Allahumma ameen. It is on this note that I want to share seven different reasons we want to be anchored by the Quran. That is the theme of this conference today. Are you paying attention? Yes or no? Ready? Seven reasons we should all want to be, and I start with myself as a reminder, we should want to be anchored by the Quran. Number one, being anchored by the Quran means that you understand how important humility is to receiving the truth. How important the state of your heart is, your fitrah, your natural disposition, is to the pursuit of truth. Here's an example. In the field of philosophy, there's a branch called epistemology. How do you know what you know? Meaning, how do you know something? How did that knowledge come to you? Don't worry about the term. There are many different ways. Today, you may come across someone who says, I will not believe in God until I experience X, Y, or Z. And they'll give you some sign of God on their terms. I will not become Muslim until you show me what I want. There were people like this before, and there are people like this today, and there will always be people like this. So sometimes you may think what? Clearly, we're lacking a physical sign that this person can experience. We need more evidences. So give me the evidences so I can convince other people. And you look in the Quran and you find what? Let's talk about the observations, the physical experiences. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam witnessed, saw with his eyes the resurrection of something dead that came to life by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people of Prophet Salih alayhi salam, what did they see when they requested a miracle to come out? What did they see? The camel, the naqa came out seemingly out of nowhere. And then you have other examples, the people who saw the splitting of the sea. Did they all believe? Did the people who chased Musa, did they all believe? No, of course not. There were the people who were with Prophet Isa السلام, asking for a ma'idah, a feast to come down from the heavens. And they ate from it, and they all remained upon belief. And on and on and on. So we recognize from this, we learn from these stories and many more, that what's missing is not 
your sensory experience of some sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not missing. That's in abundance. We are all signs. Within us are signs. Your cells, your DNA, the Quran assignment, all of these are signs. The fact that you can think and you're conscious that you're conscious, your metacognition is a sign of God. We don't need more physical signs. That's not what's missing. So you might say, well, if it's not empirical, as many people today are requesting, then maybe it's reasoning, al-aql. And you look in the Qur'an and you find some examples. The first, the primary story, is the fact that the devil was reasoning, claiming to reason, that he was better than Adam alayhi salam. Why? Because Adam alayhi salam is not made from fire, and fire is better than clay. That was his reasoning. Of course, this is an excuse. And Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, for those who are interested in noting this, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, wrote about this, and he said, in fact, there are more than a dozen proofs that clay is better than fire. So not, not only was there arrogance in this experience, but it wasn't even correct reasoning. So your reasoning can also be faulty. You have another example, Qarun. Who was Qarun? One of the richest people in history. And when they tried to give him da'wah, what happened? إِنَّمَا أُوتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عندي. I earned my wealth, all these riches, because of my intellect, my knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the earth to swallow him up. Humiliation left and right. So clearly, what's missing is not reasoning. It is not a matter of al-aql. I have spoken to people before, and there are people who will say that if they could see God, they would not believe. They would claim that they are hallucinating. So there is not a lack of signs. We are not missing some kind of magical philosophical formula that's so complex that a child could not understand it. And yet, of course, uh, in, at most, uh, in most cases, even adults cannot understand these philosophical arguments. We are not in need of them. The truth is very clear. What's missing is humility in the heart. That you are receptive to the truth. And the reality here is when we approach the Qur'an, with sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow our hearts to absorb. When you come to the speech of Allah with humility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to truly be anchored by the Qur'an. It becomes your worldview. Rather than taking your worldview from somewhere else and then filtering Islam through that lens, and then you start to find confusion and tension, and you start to find conflict, and you find that you are... Uh, confused about some very basic realities. When the heart is sincere and the person is humble, the truth is very clear. The next time you find yourself disconnected or moved by something, don't allow any pride to get in between you and the truth. Don't allow your desires, whether you claim it's reasoning or empirical or anything else, don't allow anyone or anything to get in between you and the pursuit of what is true. And not just the pursuit in terms of embracing Islam, but to reinforce your iman as well by the will of Allah. Liberate your worldview from the shackles of liberalism and you will find yourself at ease with the truth. And wallahi, it is simple. A child could understand it. So being anchored by the Qur'an means that you are humble, receptive, never looking down on others and never rejecting the truth when it comes to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility. Say ameen. Number two, being anchored by the Qur'an as a way of life means that your emotions, your happiness and your sadness could both be acts of worship if they are channeled in an effective way, in a very efficient way in a way that is molded by the Qur'an. And it is intended for us because Allah created us and knows that we have these emotions and that there is a healthy way to channel them and there's an unhealthy way as well. And so this has the potential to affect us mentally, has the potential to affect all of society. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of all of those who are struggling with any mental difficulty. Say ameen. How does a relationship with the Qur'an help with this? How does it even affect you? If you have a daily relationship with the Qur'an, you have constant reminders about what truly matters. You're constantly reminded not to be pulled down by 
other things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. You're constantly reminded about Jannah. Don't we all want Jannah? Yes, don't we all want paradise? May Allah grant us all and our loved ones the highest levels of Jannah. Say Ameen. And if you want Jannah, it's linked in the Quran to what? Fasbir, isbiru, sabiru. You're reminded to persevere. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's almost over. The difficulty will pass. The reward is so great. The ease is accompanying what you're going through. Hold on a little longer. When you read the Quran on a daily basis and you have that connection, you're reminded about Qadr. Why things happen? Why is there pain and suffering in this life? Because this life is not Jannah. Why do we go through these hardships even though we believe in the Prophet ﷺ was the best of mankind and went through more pain than we can imagine? We are reminded every time we connect to the Qur'an and with the Qur'an that the one who created your heart and the extensiveness, the potential for emotions understands and knows what you're going through and gave you the tools when you're anchored by these tools to be healthy, to be resilient, to find healing when there is trauma. وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ The Qur'an is a healing for what is in the hearts. When you read the Qur'an frequently, you are reminded, لَتَرْكَبُنَّ طَبَقًا عَنْ طبق. You will go through stage after stage. What does that mean? Nothing in life is permanent. We have in this hall, mashallah, some youngsters, and we have, mashallah, some elders. And the reality is, and everything in between, and the reality is, we all know, no stage of life is permanent. You remember 10 years ago, perhaps, where you were. You remember how your life was if you're, let's say, in your 50s and 60s. You remember how your 20s were. You remember being a child or a teenager. You remember having to study and go through school. You remember graduating, perhaps. Those who got married, you remember when you were single. And on and on and on. What's my point? Allah reminds us, so we are not attached to a stage of life. That nothing in this world is permanent. And more importantly, our lives are not permanent. This life will be replaced with another experience. You will depart from this world. So do not attach yourself to the permanent lest you be hurt more and disappointed more and in anguish more when that inevitable change comes along. And it's not so that we are sad, but rather cherish the moments Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you today. Value it. Find the greatest maximum amount of gratitude to Allah with it and through it. And attach yourself and your heart to the one who is eternal. And you will find yourself the happiest of people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those whose hearts are attached to him. Allahumma ameen. There's a young brother in my community. Every time he comes to the masjid, he asks me about something of a hardship he's going through. And then one time he said something really interesting. He said, you know what? I realized something. I've come to you as though you're my counselor. I come to you all the time. And it's not like I'm learning anything new with these reminders when I'm sad. What you're telling me makes sense. It helps me. I feel better. I move on. But then I think about it. I'm like, I already knew that. Why didn't I just feel good already? Like, why did I have to be reminded? I already know that. And the reality is, as human beings, we are in need of reminders. We all know this. Remind, for verily the reminders benefit the believers. When you cut off access to those reminders, you're cutting off access to something you need. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with the potential to forget and also to be reminded. So let us not cut off these reminders. Whether you're listening to the Quran frequently or studying its tafsir or listening to lectures, don't limit yourself to 30 second Instagram reels or something else, Allahul Musta'an, and it has that emotional background nasheed, and somebody's like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve you, and you're like, oh my God, my iman, and then you move on. 30 seconds, that's all you got. Come on. Alhamdulillah, we have opportunities like this, institutes like this. We're now in a state in which we have more access to knowledge than any previous generation. What do we do? We watch cat videos. Come on. Can you imagine Imam al-Bukhari having access to a database today with all these narrations? La ilaha illallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all the time that we've wasted. Allahumma ameen. We are in need of these reminders and we recognize our emotions are real. 
but there are very different ways of channeling them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the healthiest manner of healing and resilience and perseverance. Your sadness, believe it or not, could be an act of worship. Your happiness, believe it or not, could be an act of worship, but with conditions. And that is that the sadness is channeled towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, alleviate my fears. Ya Allah, grant me strength that you are making more dua because of your sadness. And you recognize your need for Allah. And with your happiness, what do you do? Do you stray from Allah? No. With your happiness, you are more grateful to Allah. So it becomes an act of worship for you. Turn your emotions into acts of worship by channeling them towards Allah. And this comes about by being anchored by the Qur'an. Number three. Being anchored by the Qur'an means that you know your life has value and meaning. Your life has value and meaning. One time, a young college student reached out to me. And I'm going to give an example and change part of the scenario just to be a little anonymous with it. A college student, her whole life, her parents had been telling her to have high ambitions for a career. So she aimed for medical school. Is this new to us as Muslims? No. She got into med school. Year two of med school, she was caught cheating on an exam. Investigation took place. She was expelled. It went on her record, she could not apply to any other medical school program. She reached out with this long message to summarize. She said, my entire life, I was building for this. My parents were building me for this. My siblings encouraging me, my friends all on the same track. I have lost everything that gave my life meaning. I don't know why I'm living anymore. And while this may seem like an extreme example, the reality is many people, maybe even in this hall, maybe many people in your families or in our communities feel this way to a degree about other things. Maybe not your career. For some people, they find that their value is in whether or not they are married or they have children. Whether or not they have a career, you don't have a job, whether or not they look a certain way to society. So they will ascribe their value, they will hand it their value, hand it off to whom? To everyone else. Validate me. Is your life in terms of value and meaning and purpose limited to one of these categories? Your education, your job, whether or not you're married or you have children? Is that what your life really was for? That's why you were created? Or are these things you want and pursue, but they're not guaranteed in this life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you value that no human being can take away. Allah gave you worth that no material thing can ever compare to. Wallahi, you have value and no one can take it away. You have value and nothing can take it away. You were created to worship Allah. Can someone take that away from you? No. You were created to know your you were created to know your creator. You were created to seek forgiveness from Allah. Can any human being tell you you cannot do that? No. No matter what you lose of a dunya, your value is always fulfilled so long as you make the choice to live for that purpose. That is a choice no one can take away from you. Do not allow society or social media or the pressures of other people or cultures or parents to make you think that you have less value if you are holding on to your Islam. However, of course, of course we want to pursue the best of things in a dunya. There are sunnah in this life we pursue. For people to get married, it's a sunnah. Try to pursue it. To have children, try to pursue it. But do not think you lost any self-worth when you did not get that thing. That's the point. So that when that thing is gone, you don't say, my life has no meaning. What do you mean? You were created to worship Allah, you can still worship Allah. Yes, there is pain, and I'm not belittling that pain. Yes, there is grief, and there's a way to overcome that grief, and that was the last point we covered. But your worth and your value comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are anchored by the Qur'an, you realize very quickly that you were created for the most noble purpose, and that nothing in this world can take you away from that. So do not allow people, do not allow people to shackle you 
and make you think that they define your value and worth in this life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who always realize that we have noble purpose and value and meaning with Allah. Allahumma ameen. Number four. Being anchored by the Qur'an means you are constantly trying to improve and you don't give up. There is no such thing as being successful without slipping up. Being perfect with a thousand attempts or practices or whatever it may be. At any career or field or, or sport without struggling along the way. And that's the same case for the believers. The hope is that you keep trying. The hope is that you don't give up. The hope is that you recognize that the devil wins once you've given up. And you will continue to win so long as you persist. How many times? Once, a hundred, a thousand, you keep trying until your last breath. Now some people are not happy. They're disconnected from the Qur'an, disconnected from Allah, disconnected from the purpose of life, chasing after something of this life, as we see on social media and through the media that is uh, public, uh, published today and sent all over the world, unfortunately, that some people think that that's what matters. So they're never happy. They're never content. They never have enough. This person became a millionaire, I don't feel satisfied. Some people are racing to become billionaires and others are racing to become trillionaires. You have this thing, when's the next thing coming? Satisfaction is gone. You ordered that thing, it got to your house in two hours, you got validated with that hyper-consumerist approach of buying whatever you want. Okay, great, the box arrived to the house and everyone looked around and said, who ordered this Amazon package today? And then what? The feeling of receiving something new wore off. You want something else. The reality for the believers is, you get to a point where you have enough. I'm not saying you can't aim high, but you have enough to the point where you don't feel empty inside, despite having more than like 90% of what the world has, despite being satisfied with a job, or a family, or the ability to eat every day and not worry, am I going to have another meal? The Prophet ﷺ said, he has succeeded the one who is guided to Islam, granted Sufficient provision, meaning you're granted enough to live and you're content with it. And you are content with it. You're happy with what you have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us contentment. Allahumma ameen. Number five. Being anchored by the Quran means that you are a person of justice in all forms. Sometimes when we talk about justice, we limit it to one scope, one facet, one domain. There's justice with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? That you fulfill the right of the creator, that you worship the creator. He created you, you worship him alone. And then there's justice with human beings, and that is an extensive field. There's justice with animals, in the way you treat animals with mercy. There's justice with the environment, that you protect it as a believer. We should be at the forefront of Islamic environmentalism in the world. But there's a warning here as well. Do not become like these social justice activists who put in 110% effort when it comes to the rights of people, but they violate, violate every right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any remorse whatsoever. These are not mutually exclusive. They are not. Yes, we advocate for the rights of people through the lens of Islam. But we also need to be constantly reminding society and bringing humanity back to that fitrah, the natural disposition, that you are not a just person. If the message of God reaches you and you reject it, that's not justice for your soul. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, people who do that are oppressing themselves. فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ Amongst many other examples, Allah will never wrong His creation. But people wrong themselves. Rather, as believers, we need to be just with every aspect and every facet of justice. The Prophet ﷺ, in the last months of his life, gave a number of sermons during the final hajj. Not to one, but multiple. And one of these sermons, the farewell speeches, one of them is taken out of context, usually used in a social justice domain, and it ignores everything else that the Prophet ﷺ said about worshipping Allah. Everything about ibadah, forget about it. All they take is this one excerpt. 
but it's a very crucial one. When the Prophet wasallam said, there's no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab over an Arab, nor black over white, nor white over black, illa bi taqwa. Your status is through your God consciousness, your humility, your submission to the Creator. That's your status and your honor. It's not through your wealth, your skin color, your nationality, your passport, or anything of this world. People at that time were struggling with this problem. There was a clear structure, not just one or two people. There was a structure of injustice. There was a structure of oppression. And the reality is, some people then needed it, and the world is still in need of it today. We are clearly in need of it today. And we are not just talking about non-Muslims. We as Muslims are in need of it today. The Prophet ﷺ continued, and he said that we are all from Adam, wa Adam min turab. We are all the children of Adam. And Adam came from the clay of this world. Do not become arrogant. In fact, by looking for the only thing that gives you status, taqwa, you cannot possibly have taqwa and also be arrogant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility. Allahumma ameen. The structures of injustice and oppression were the main reason some people refused to become Muslim. Do you know that in one of the stories, you find this in the seerah, one of the people who thought of himself as the elite of Quraysh, he said, you want us, the elites, to be like them? You want us to be at the same level as the people that had just been freed? They used to be our slaves? You want us to be equal? They refused. And the reality is these structures, when you hear of these stories, you think, wow, I can't believe they did that. There are still structures in America and around the world today. Not one-off cases, but structures that, that cause certain groups and individuals to be at a disadvantage in society. They give preferences to some over others. If you have political connections or you're extremely wealthy or you're this or you're that, there are structures that give preferences or more ease to white over black in some cases. And we know this. This is not new to us as Muslims. 25% of American Muslims are black. We know this. It's part of our community. There are structures today, and this is changing in the world. And clearly in America, there's this opposition of ideas that gives the preference to the secular, anti-religious ideas to the religious communities. There's a structure that gives preferences, advantages to the occupier over the occupied, like in Palestine for over 70 years. There's a structure that does the same thing, and in fact imitates and learns from that occupation of Palestine, all the way in India against the Muslims there. The same structure you find, replicated in different form, with the ethnic cleansing of Uyghurs in East Turkestan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate their affairs, and all of our brothers and sisters around the world. These structures of oppression or apartheid or ethnic cleansing or injustice cannot be ignored by anyone who claims to be a proponent of universal justice. Wallahi, that is a lie. If you support universal justice, you would be on the right side of history. You would be supporting these causes. In Allah, ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. A command for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to be people of justice and fair dealing. And part of this is qist. In the Quran, it's not just adil, but qist. In Allah, yuhibbul muqsitin. It's a socio-economic, political facet of justice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that. Allahumma ameen. Brothers and sisters, remember this. A little bit of justice from a lot more people would change society significantly. Be just with your family, with your parents, with your wife, with your husband, with your children. Be just. Be just with your neighbors. Be just even with the people you dislike. That is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number six, being anchored by the Quran means that you are always thinking of the ummah, part of the jama'ah, connected to the masajid, bringing Muslims together and not dividing them further. We have enough divisions as it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold fast to the rope of Allah, the Quran and the sunnah. Together, and do not become divided. The Prophet ﷺ warned us, Alaykum bil jama'ah, adhere to the jama'ah, the community, and beware of separation, for the devil is with one, the one who is isolated. 
Do not become isolated. Do not isolate people. Do not push people away from the houses of Allah, from Islam, whether through your character or anything else. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the devil is further away from two. The more you have, the better. Stick to the jama'ah, and this will bring you some benefit, inshallah. And finally, number seven. Being anchored by the Qur'an means that you are always laser-focused on the final destination. When you put in your GPS, you usually know where you're going. What is your destination? You have two options. We all know our desired destination is Jannah. May Allah grant us Jannah. Say Ameen. You have to be laser-focused on it. Why? Because this life is filled with distractions. La ilaha illallah. Left and right, every single day, distractions of all forms. So we have to be reminded, when you are connected to the Qur'an, you are constantly reminded of what destination you claim you want. Now plant the seed of that destination. Do not allow anyone, anything of this life, to get in between you and Jannah. Wallahi, it's not worth it. You don't want to stand on that day and say, I wish I stuck to my goal. Rather, you want to say, Alhamdulillah. وَجَزَاهُمْ بِمَا صَبَرُوا جَنَّةً وَحَرِيرًا Allah will reward the believers with paradise for their patience, their perseverance, and all the rewards of Jannah, including the silk garments. <inaudible> I have rewarded them for their patience, their perseverance, their hard work. No one said it's easy. Their hard work, that they are the true winners on this day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those winners. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, he says, there is no true comfort, raha, for the believer until he meets Allah. Imagine you enter Jannah. Finally, you enter Jannah and you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, where are my servants who worship me without ever seeing me? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all patience and perseverance and an anchoring with and through and to the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us constantly to filter everything out through the Qur'an meaning filter life and other ideologies and what's being discussed by looking through the lens of the Qur'an. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate our affairs and make us and our loved ones and future generations amongst the people of La ilaha illallah. Allahumma ameen wa salli lahum ala nabina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.